Grab your favorite caffeinated beverage and get cozy because you are listening to Mindful as a Mother with Paige Bruce and Lindsay Adams. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for therapy or the therapeutic relationship, and the information given in this podcast is purely for educational purposes and is not intended to replace the advice of a professional. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mindful as a Mother, and we are here today with two very special guests. They are the phenomenal doctors and authors of Different Thinkers ADHD. Will you guys just take a moment and introduce yourself? Yeah, definitely. Hello, my name is Yael Rothman. and I'm Katya Fredrickson. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. We are pediatric neuropsychologists uh, based out of Maryland in a private practice. And I'm not sure if it would be helpful to uh, explain what a pediatric neuropsychologist is um, for your listeners. Yes. Oh, great. It would be. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> um, neuropsychology is a branch of uh, psychology that really looks at brain behavior relationships. And we both have backgrounds. You get uh, our doctorates are in clinical psychology. And then we went on to do uh, uh, postdoctoral fellowships to study pediatric neuropsychology. This means how we apply it is we do uh, mainly assessments where uh, individuals both of us are more like age six to 18, come to us mm -hmm. with questions of learning differences, challenges, developmental differences, emotional um, functioning uh, differences. And they we do testing and then help with diagnosis and creating a treatment plan. And um, that is how uh, families would utilize us. Katya, would you like to add to that? Well, yeah, and an important part of that, um, you know, which we emphasize in our feedback with families and with the kids themselves and in the reports is fleshing out not only the areas that are of concern um, and also, but also being able to say at the end of the day, hey, so-and-so is really good at X, Y, or Z. Here's how we can promote that strength, et cetera. So yeah, it's sort of trying to get a full view of their functioning um, and present that to um, the parents and then the child themselves. Thank you so much. That is such an important, yes, we, we show this, this is your profile of how you think and learn best. And also these things are um, uh, maybe some areas of challenge and how we can support you there. This is such an important part of what we do because Lindsay and I both operate as individual clinicians working one-on-one -on -one with the kiddos, but so often it's like we are not the ones trained to provide the assessments to get the hard evidence, you know, for the families. And so oftentimes we're like, can you please go get a full neuropsych assessment? So that way we can highlight these strengths and really create like life hacks around these specific strengths of your child and know these different points of how they think differently so we can work around that. that uh, and all the information in those assessments is so helpful to both the parents and the, the therapist or the clinician or professional working with your child. It is like a, it's almost like a roadmap sometimes I feel like to like how to work best with them and parent them and create a life that works for them. We're so glad that's uh, that's our goal is to make this uh, treatment plan, but also um, as we'll talk about today, it's to share with the child themselves so they can become their best self-advocate and, and learn about how they think and learn best as well. Yes. And that is one of the main points that we wanted to touch on today. I do want to throw out there because I'm a woman's woman. Um, you are two female doctors who have written a book and that's a huge celebration in and of itself. So I have to say that or else I wouldn't be me. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Um, so I often will go and I contract with schools and middle school age groups and do some social emotional skills, whether that's like teamwork or collaboration or problem solving skills, conflict resolution, all the things. And one of the ones that comes up a lot is really breaking down the stigma of thinking differently because, and, and I'm trying to like really figure out where that comes from within society, but a lot of my like middle school age boys have this idea that like, oh, I'm ADHD. And so, and it's a, 
like a negative. Like this is the stigma around it. Like I'm not as good or I shouldn't be able to do that. Is that something mm-hmm. that you guys are familiar with? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, you need to, it, it, there needs to be a balanced presentation. I mean, certainly the reason that a diagnosis is assigned for any sort of diagnosis is that there's some pattern of vulnerabilities that's impacting the person in some area of their life, right? Otherwise we wouldn't call it, I mean, we wouldn't diagnose something otherwise. That's like the basic sort of, um, you know, box that you have to tick for any of our diagnoses. So there's something there that may be harder for that person, right? And so the idea is to sort of respect that and be like, yeah, hey, I do understand that, you know, X, Y, Z may be, yeah, for sure. That may in fact be harder for you and you may have to work harder than the average kid around you. And so let's figure out some ways um, to make you successful in that regard. So sort of acknowledging that certain things are harder, but then what can we do about it, um, you know, to sort of move forward? I love that. And I feel like it it is a balance, even especially as a therapist in a clinical setting, a balance between validating the experience and also focusing on the strengths that come with it and the things that they're really good at. Right. I heard um, someone referred, um, was talking about um, a, um, a friend of mine was talking about her. She has three um, teenage sons with ADHD diagnoses. And she was saying how in their ha- household, the mantra is ADHD is an explanation for why things are harder, but it's not an excuse. Like we're still going to be, you know, working to do our best um, just with these sorts of, uh, with the understanding that certain things may require more work and effort and sort of respect for that, but not giving up on goals. Right. Yeah, I, I love that. I'm writing it down. <laughs> and that you like that. We also <laughs> talked about how um, celebrating the differences is so important too. And I know you talk a lot about neurodiversity and we definitely discuss that as well and how we kind of equate it that it's to neurodiversity is to human culture as biodiversity is to the ecosystem, right? So we need these uh pieces to make our world work. We need different thinkers. Um, These are the people who can move our society forward. And to think about these differences as not deficits, but in fact can be strengths as well. So I I definitely think that's an important part of this picture. And we can discuss um, strengths that go along with the ADHD profile here too. Yeah, I love that. And I think these are all really important things to touch on because we do have a pretty wide social media audience. And oftentimes we get comments like, um, well, what's not neurodivergent then? Or stop using these soft terms or like a lot of feedback, right? As a lot of people are doing the unlearning and relearning of neurodiversity. So the phrase that neurodiversity is to humans, like biodiversity is to nature or the world, however you phrased it, was much more elegant than I am now. But like that to me is such an important aspect where it's like, it's not, it's not this like blanket thing that we're just throwing out. So now everyone's neurodivergent and everything. And now something's wrong with everyone and you can't function. Like that's not the case. Right. It's funny because, you know, there used to be when I was in training and I'm probably the same for you all as well. I mean, just this idea that there was the quote unquote, um, you know, comparing a child to the quote unquote neurotypical child. Um, And I know that not everybody has um, a sort of a profile that will reach, have you reaching for some sort of diagnosis per se, but I feel like everybody does have something somewhere on a spectrum, right? of um, sort of anxiety or or whatever it is. And so these days, I don't feel as much comfortable using that language like, oh, well, compared to a neurotypical child, your child, blah, blah, it just feels um, like, well, where is this neurotypical child? I mean, again, there are obviously varying degrees of difficulty and that's what makes something, um, you know, sort of stand out or or, um, feel less sort of remarkable. But still, I mean, I'm not saying we all have everything because that's disrespectful to someone for whom, you know, their characteristics is really sort of affect their functioning in a significant way. But that being said, I mean, I think we're much better now at noticing that um, people who seem to be sort of trucking along just fine in their lives, very often there's something going on there that we might not have been aware of. Absolutely. And there's a lot of terms that we come across in our own research 
um, such as neuro majority and neuro minority, are there terms that you're much more comfortable using that we, I mean, that I could adopt? Honestly, that's why I'm asking. I actually quite like that term, neuro majority, neuro minority. What do you think, Yael? I I haven't I I haven't been exposed to it. Um, yeah. so that that's uh very interesting to hear. Um, I. I think I still do talk to my clients about the idea of neurodiversity, neurodivergent, and, and go through those. But it also, when we talk to the kiddos, I want them to feel comfortable with these terms. So I allow whatever openness and where wherever, meet the child where they're at. If they in, uh, feel that these are empowering terms, that's amazing. And if it's not, then we go down a different path. Yeah, um, I... My son's autistic, and so we have a lot of conversations about what language he likes to have used around his autism. And so I think it's so specific to the individual child that that's what makes being online hard is because you're going to use terms and it's not the particular term that that person would like to be used. But I think that it really comes down to asking the child how they would like their their stuff to be referred to, just like me, like I how I want my experience to be referred to as well. Right, it just and, shows a basic level of respect, right? Yeah, yeah, and of, it's been really helpful in like it, for my son, like accepting and embracing his diagnosis. Is that something he gets control over? Is how he refers to it, and how our family refers to it, and his teachers and things like that. And that really was an important reason for us to create this resource that we did of um, Different Thinkers ADHD, uh, our book that was made for elementary school children, because we do feel that it's so important for the child themselves to understand their brain, how it, how it works, how they think and learn best, and then take that information and use it to become their own best advocates um, in the future and to challenge misconceptions they might have. I think you said before, maybe this, uh, these boys were thinking this was a negative that you were working with that. Um, and sometimes that goes along with some self-deprecating statements. Perhaps you hear young people say without knowing why, um, instead of I struggle to focus on things that I don't like, it might be, I'm so stupid. I'll never be as good as so-and-so. And we can replace that with the actual truth of actually your brain works this way and we can support you and help you here and change those negative perceptions. What inspired you to create this book and how do you guys know each other? Oh, well, so we work at the same group practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was there first, but that's, uh, you know, of, of little <laughs> significance. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, so we, um, we were part of the same kind of, uh, case consult group and, um, you know, I mean, I guess we decided we liked each other, you know, so, um, and had sort of similar perspectives on, on, um, on things. And then this was, um, sort of, I know it takes a while for books to get processed, right? But this, we wrote this during, um, COVID in like, um, in 2020. And so I know it's, uh, feels like quite a long, <laughs> a long time ago relative to a publication date in early 2024, but it just takes a while. Um, but yeah, so, um, we were, I think looking for ways to keep our, our brains sort of occupied because we had, you know, our practice had shut for a period of time and we were both home with young kids and um, trying to do virtual school and virtual this and virtual that. And um, this was a nice sort of after bedtime um, escape to spending time with an adult who we, um, you know, who was a friend and who could share sort of our interests professionally. And um, it was a nice opportunity for us to, um, you know, have that outlet. Um, and so it kind of grew out of that. It, it, so that time period um, and also just our sense professionally that, I mean, all the time clients ask us for book ideas, um, either for themselves, resources or to, you know, for their children. And we had had a sort of a hard time finding something that really spoke um, to a specific diagnosis. Like a lot of the books out there will address various sorts of characteristics or traits without necessarily stepping back and um, and it's describing the entire diagnosis or developmental condition associated with that. Um, and so that's sort of what we were trying to do to, again, help put names on things and um, provide sort of a description of the range in which 
things can look. So our next book is on autism and similar to this book, the ADHD book, we're, we're presenting three vignettes where we go through sort of just different because so many different presentations are captured by the same diagnostic label and that can be so confusing for people and for kids. Um, so, add yeah. us to your list for that. Please let us know. I will pre-order it. Oh, yeah, oh. right, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we gave it to the publisher a little while ago, so now we're just waiting on the... <laughs> <laughs> I... And it, it's just um, also we want not only to empower the children, but also the the families, the caregivers and other professionals. I think um, I'm not sure in your practices, but often parents do come to us with worries about sharing diagnoses with children, um, scared about giving a label that could be uh, perceived negatively, I think, by the child. And we want them to understand that Unfortunately, kids can give themselves labels no matter what. Like I just said before, these negative labels instead of these more uplifting, positive understandings of who they are. So we're hoping that this book can be a, a joint effort between a child and their caregiver or family or professional to also um, feel comfortable around the different thinking style. I love that. I think as adults, we're doing a lot of unlearning and relearning around ADHD, right? That's specific. This book is specific, different thinkers, ADHD. And so we're doing a lot of unlearning what that means, because I think as a parent now, what I grew up with, the belief around being labeled or diagnosed with a, uh, with a learning difference is different than today. Oh, so 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely unpacking a lot of fears around like parenting a child with ADHD and what the perception will be of their peers and their teachers and, you know, helping frame it in a way of like, there are a lot of, I use the word superpowers. I'm like, there are a lot of superpowers that you have, that your child has, and it makes them incredible. Like it makes them who they are today and being able to acknowledge and recognize how that like helps them and how it's a huge part of their personality and also what ways that it might be more challenging depending on what we're encountering right um for sure and I don't know if you've had this experience because we've just heard a lot of stories recently where you share this and then the parent starts to identifying um a lot of themselves and I've uh had a few people who have written me now um uh who have looked through our book and said oh this is interesting like <laughs> um, uh someone just told me they were reading the book with their eight-year-old and the eight-year-old said oh this is like you mom when you interrupt all the time <laughs> and uh -huh. that was so she she wrote to me about it I was like how interesting that you guys can identify and talk about that <laughs> yep I I think a huge part of our audience are parents that identify their own neurodivergence after their children are diagnosed and I myself and Lindsay too are both like late life like adult diagnosed ADHD like it wasn't the diagnosis as we were children. Um, and that it's been life-changing to be able to identify it. But again, it's because we had our kids and we're like, oh, like now mm -hmm. this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. So often. Yeah. I mean, we, at our practice, it is a range of pediatric and adult professionals. And so it's not uncommon that we will, you know, end up, ah, oh, you, you want to look into your potential sort of profile. Let me, let me refer you yes. to it. And yeah, because, and that can provide such <clears throat> a valuable perspective as a parent, right? I mean, because on the one hand, um, on the one hand, it's sort of a double-edged sword, right? Because on the one hand, I think it can induce some fear and worry because you might sort of have had negative experiences related to the characteristics growing up yourself, potentially because things weren't, you know, appropriately identified or, you know. And so there may be sort of this fear that the child will have um, sort of the same experience. But then on the flip side, the perspective that the parent can then bring to the child's inner sort of experience and um, strengths and weaknesses, I think, can make an enormous, you know, and just it's so powerful, the modeling that we as parents can do, because who do our kids look up to more? Right. I mean, for good or ill, there are times when we wish they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't mimic our behavior, right? But uh, to who do they look up to more? The more we can model, oh, wow, you know, yeah, I really, it's really been hard for me to do X, but, um, you know, I tried this strategy and, you know, it really, what you do know what I mean? Like that sort of thing can be very powerful for children. Yeah. And there's so much knowledge or so much power that comes with knowledge because a big part of what we emphasize is understanding things about yourself help you 
learn how to regulate and navigate a life that will help you feel successful in parenthood. And that's, that's like a big part of what we discuss, especially when it comes to like emotional regulation and modeling because of the shame and guilt spirals. Um, will you guys just give us like an introduction to what this book is for our audience who will hopefully it's out now, right? It's, it's published, it's released this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And um, uh, to add to the uh, women empowerment, our uh, illustrator is also a female who was fantastic in this. I'm here for it. Very. Exciting. Yes, I love this. <laughs> yeah, I do. I love the illustrations. We were so lucky. Do you want to outline the book yet, Al, or do you... Oh, either way, yeah. We um, created the book to begin just explaining a little bit about who we are and a little bit about what pediatric neuropsychology is and then went into brain development. Um, uh, it's not always discussed, I think, when the with the kids when we're talking about diagnoses in general, but we just wanted to talk about that um, what is this amazing organ inside of your head and give uh, some age appropriate understanding of what brain development looks like especially if we're thinking about specific diagnoses like ADHD, where we know that there is a little bit of a different brain development. So we wanted to kind of address that here too. Then we introduce um, three different characters who present their symptoms of ADHD a little bit differently from one to the other. So we have a female who um, presents more in the inattentive presentation, which is a more common presentation in females. And we have uh, a young boy who is having more challenges with impulse control or regulation. So we can kind of see a few different presentations. Um, not every single thing that can exist, but a few different presentations. And follow them through their days and what's been going on. And then talk about how this constellation of symptoms could mean that you have ADHD. And we talk through um, what executive functioning is a little bit and talk through the diagnosis of um, ADHD, the strengths that go along with being a different thinker, and then how to support some of the challenges. So we end coming up with a little bit of a workbook. So where the child themselves who's reading the book gets to write in a little bit about their strengths their challenges, and maybe some ideas that they've learned from the book that can be supportive and helpful here too. Um, Kachi, would you want to add anything there? No, I think that was pretty thorough. I mean, the idea is, again, to go beyond, hey, this is Jimmy who struggles with personal space, like a specific, one specific characteristic, and to try to present, and obviously it's so complicated, you can't present every, I mean, you know, you can't, um, you can't, uh, present every sort of way in which the diagnosis might look, but to try to be thorough there in terms of, because um, that's one of the issues I think sometimes with with um, explaining a diagnosis to a child is um, parents will sometimes say, oh, well, she won't, um, she won't understand or she won't believe that she has ADHD because her brother has ADHD and she doesn't get along with him or do you know what I mean? Like he's quite mm -hmm. different presentation and so we really thought it was important to flesh out those different vignettes um, so that kids could hopefully see some characteristics they identified with personally as they went through the book yeah and I think that's such a powerful piece because it does present so differently mm -hmm. and we tried to end um, lots of the uh, presentations with does this ever happen to you or have you ever had this experience to try to make the book talk to the child um, who is uh, consuming the information there and reading. And we actually, uh, there is also a section where we allude to the fact that ADHD can run in families. And so that provides mm -hmm. the parents with a nice opportunity if they would like to sort of say, actually, when I was a kid, I had some of these similar sorts of, you know, so it opens that door if parents want to sort of um, pursue that. I love that. We've kind of talked around diagnosing. Why do you think important to talk to a child about their diagnosis? Well, I think, um, well, a number of reasons. I think, first of all, again, we sort of worry that the child will, you know, many kids are aware that there's something that isn't going quite right, you know, 
there's a, a reason, uh, you know, maybe they're, they've been getting some negative feedback from teachers, from parents, from peers, whatever it is, there's something that um, isn't going quite the way they would like in their lives. Um, and again, as yeah, Elle was saying, you know, very often we as human beings are very quick to jump to a negative self-attribution, um, which is oftentimes really excessively harsh, <laughs> you know, so like lots of our um, kids who are struggling with attention, it may affect their learning and then they may just think that they're not good learners or what, you know, I'm just bad at X, Y, Z, right, and develop, it develops into that unhealthy fixed mindset, which is hard to sort of can become entrenched, you know. And so again, just this idea of um, wanting to provide an accurate and and just essentially a kinder and more understanding label for or explanation for what's going on. Um, and then also, I think too, there is an element of, I mean, respect, right? I mean, around if there is something and we know what this something is, um, why would we not share that in a developmentally appropriate manner for the child, right? I mean, don't they deserve to know this about themselves and to know that this is what we've learned from the evaluation process? Um, so there's that element as well that I think is important. And of course, I mean, you know, you can um, vary that how you present it. And that's what we, I mean, that's why in the book, we sort of, we're trying to hit this sort of elementary aged, you know, kindergarten and up type target and so parents can emphasize the areas that you know based on their child's developmental level like you can do a deep dive into the brain or you can sort of skim over that if your kid's not interested in that or not at that level yet you know so just this idea of adapting um, how we explain things but nonetheless offering some sort of explanation um, for the child's well-being and our field has really evolved at, at least in pediatric neuropsychology it used to be that really the uh, information was only given to the family, like the parents, where we would sit down and just really tell the parents, here's what's going on, here's the plan, go off and um, put that into place. Um, and now we all, not all, but I would see the majority of us feel that it's so important to include a child into this conversation as well. And um, what unfortunately has happened, I, I'm not sure in your practices if you've had this experience where things have been withheld from a child and then in adolescence they come and find out, oh, actually I did have a diagnosis that I never knew about. It's almost an identity crisis sometimes. Like that's what explains this. Like well, I, I could have known that my whole life and, and, and had that spiral of happening and we want to avoid that. We want people to understand, here's your amazing strengths. Here's some things that are hard for you, just like everyone in the world, you have strengths and challenges. And here's how we can help. Yeah, I especially appreciate that you both touched on the intuitive piece. Our children are much more self-aware and intuitive than I, I think sometimes I even believe of my own children. It takes a minute for my brain to catch up like, oh, hey, and so oftentimes when I get to operate as a practitioner with a child, I do notice that they're like, why am I not making friends? Why do people do this when I'm around, right? Like these types of curiosity. And I think, Lindsay, if you're open to it, I'm springing it on you, get nervous. Um, I would love to know the impact it had on you to be diagnosed late in life, because I feel like sometimes we, I have experiences and I'm like, well, if it was like this for me, I wonder if that's what it's like mm -hmm. for my child or for the children. Right. And so I would just kind of want to know how it impacted you or what kinds of differences it made for you when you finally received your diagnosis. It helped me understand a lot of things about myself that I had viewed negatively, or I had those entrenched negative self-beliefs about why I struggled with emotional regulation why I struggled with fall through on certain things or why I, you know um get a hit of dopamine and take everything out of my pantry and then the dopamine would wear off and I'd be like I never want to finish this I'm so overwhelmed and I always just thought I was lazy or I didn't have energy mm -hmm. and and that's no, not what it was and so it was really empowering for me and there was also a little bit of grief that came with that because it was like how different could my life have been had I known some of these things about myself younger and how I, instead of like unpacking and trying to view myself differently in my thirties, I could have not 
not had all those <laughs> limiting beliefs about myself. And I would have been able to create ways that work for me. And it's okay to have a laundry basket in every room of the house because I can see them and I can just throw it right in there and just little things like that, but also bigger things and a lot of grief about maybe how I've been so hard on myself in my life. Yeah. And isn't the irony that so often um, when parents are reluctant to share a diagnosis, it's because they're reluctant to hurt the child's feelings in some way, you know what I mean? And um, it's just, uh, I, I mean, and as parents, I mean, we can understand where we try to protect our kids, but self-knowledge, uh, you know, restricting their, their self-knowledge or their ability to understand things about themselves is not, I don't think that that's a good form of protection, you know? And in fact, I mean, it helps us advocate for them and it helps them advocate for themselves. I mean, how often is it, I'm sure that you guys liaise with teachers as part of your work and, um, you know, depending on a teacher's level of expertise and experience, they can interpret a child's behavior in the classroom in very different ways, you know. So um, I'd much rather that a teacher understood that a child has ADHD, for example, versus thinking, oh, well, that kid just doesn't care about learning and is just always busy goofing off kind of thing, because that attitude um, <clears throat> will affect how the teacher interacts with the child and then can form, perform the sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, which is um, you know, so negative for the student as a learner. And we hope that teachers don't feel that way about our students, but that does happen. And well, for sure. I mean, when you're yeah. spending like seven hours a day with someone who is really struggling with self-regulation and you don't know why, I mean, you could see that. Yeah. I'm not saying it's, a good, I'm not saying it's good or okay, but you can see that teachers might, you know, Absolutely. you might go your own conclusion. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. Yeah, that it's a reality. And we actually last season of the podcast had another author and she had a, a couple different books and we specifically talked to her about her elementary age book. There's the Yeti in my tummy, um, <laughs> but she had another book and she was very specifically passionate about holding that compassionate and empathetic stance for the teachers and being able to provide that bridge of education for the teachers to under understand it better, to be able to like connect with the students more to, to be more regulated in themselves. So that way we're not viewing those behaviors necessarily as those attacks or those difficulties. And so I think it's just, it's incredible all the different work that's happening in all these different ways if we're able to like pull it in. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, it's, as you were saying, it's, it's so far ahead and leaps and bounds from where it was when we were. And I think I'm a little older than everybody in this room, but I mean, <laughs> Your kids. <laughs> I think it's uh I mean it's just amazing how much it's progressed like the sorts of um labels that you know the sorts of things that we would uh I don't know just you can't even imagine these days right yeah absolutely and thank you Lindsay for being willing to share because those examples of just believing you're lazy or thinking something's wrong with you because you just never have energy like these are some very real internalized ways that those labels start and they do start in childhood like though that's the basis of where they are um so when we're talking different thinkers how can wait hold on I just want to say oh I just want to say one more thing about the label I think when parents are talking to their children about diagnos diagnosis and they want to avoid the label, I think it's important to take a step back and realize where your own beliefs are about the stigma of ADHD, because oftentimes our child doesn't have those same beliefs about ADHD or labels or themselves. And by and it's really our own beliefs that we need to work through or our own stuff from childhood um, and how, how we think about these things or about our child being quote unquote different or having a label. And so go to therapy, talk to somebody, do what you need to do so that you can work through that so that, that you can have an open, honest dialogue on an age appropriate level with your child about what's going on with them. That is so beautifully put. And actually at the end of our book, we have these tips for parents and caregivers and educators. When you read it, number one is you feel comfortable about the subject matter and, um, uh, and, and work on that for yourself before exposing your child. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I think too along the lines is those limiting beliefs that um, our parenting or the quality of parent we are are going to be judged because of our children having this diagnosis or because of the behaviors. And so I think that that's one that a lot of us 
have to unpack that we don't realize we have to unpack. And then just as like a, like a contrast, I also have ADHD and so does my husband, but we like, for us, it's like a quirky thing. And at least two out of three of our children have ADHD for us. It's just like, Oh, that's just, it's just part of like, that's just what I do. Like that's part of the quirkiness. Like I talk in circles or I have to come back into the house three or four times before I actually leave. So I give myself more time before I leave. Like, and so it's, it's interesting to see how we can evolve from this like negative belief about myself that I'm lazy or I'm forgetful, right? Or I'm stupid even to this idea that like, oh, I have to, like my keys have a home or else I lose them. <laughs> like, right. if, they, if they're not in their home, they run away and I'm not leaving the house because I don't know where they are. Right. Knowing yourself and developing strategies like, like the laundry hamper and the, you know, what you were mentioning such things that seem so sort of minor, but can make such an enormous difference in the quality of your day-to-day life, right? Yes, absolutely. Just hacking those systems. So before we end, I do want to talk about how celebrating our differences can help make everyone feel included, because that's a big point of your book also. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea is well, I'm sure we all have sort of, uh, you know, our, our own sort of thoughts about this based on our own personal experience and our families and all of this. But I mean, the idea is that, um, in my opinion, there's so much uh, culturally that we associate uh, with certain sort of um, developmental stages. Like I think about, um, you know, elementary school and it's like, all oh, the little kids play soccer and they play a musical instrument and they, you know what I mean? Like there's these sort of cultural mores that are, <laughs> right, um, that are uh, sort of embedded in, in our society. And there are so many kids though who don't fit into that, mold. like my kids don't fit into that mold. We are not sporty. Let me tell you that <laughs> they inherited uh, no sportiness from me. <laughs> um, so there are so many kids who don't fall into those quite narrow constraints. Um, and there's, I mean, there's nothing to be ashamed or, or unhappy about if your kid doesn't fall into those, those sorts of constraints. Um, because there are so many other ways to, um, so many other strengths to, to develop and, and just so many other pursuits to enjoy. Right. I often talk to, and I'm going a little off subject here, but can, you know, parents are often worried about kids going to middle school and oh, middle school is so scary and all of this. And I'll often say, well, Hey, think about it though. I mean, middle school, suddenly we've moved beyond like all the, this sort of limited range of activities. They're like, you can do stage crew and you can do drama and you can, I mean, it just opens up so many potential um, social avenues for kids who don't necessarily follow that stereotypical mold. Um, and so I just, um, you know, if we all followed that mold, the world would be a pretty darn boring place, right? And we wouldn't be making uh, that much progress, would we? I mean, it's it's the idea of all of us sort of um, pursuing our own sort of interests and passions. And that's one of the things I love about ADHD is how kids can really just dig deep when they're super interested in something and they enjoy it and, um, you know, they can become really knowledgeable um, about their areas of interest. And I mean, so to me, it's just, uh, I know I've sort of ranged about a bit in this answer, but I feel strongly about it. Just it, just that there's um, different thinkers make the world go around and um, they make the world an interesting, pa- an interesting place and they ensure that the world continues to move forward. And that's sort of what we're trying to celebrate in the book. And just in general, when we, when we meet with kids and sort of go over test findings with them, do you want to add anything, Yael? I know I sort of blathered yeah. on over there, but I I think there's been um, many uh, famous people who have come out and talked about how ADHD has benefited their careers. Uh, there's a high number of CEOs because they've been able to be different thinkers. They were able to create companies. There's athletes and actors and journalists. Um, uh, there's this. Uh, research has even shown a higher level of creativity in individuals with ADHD, which is uh, pretty amazing. And um, when, like Katya said, when you can uh, channel these areas of passion and interest into vocational careers, amazing things happen in the future. We also know that these individuals are resilient and willing, more willing to take risks and um, and that abundant energy that some possess can be a beautiful thing. So there, this 
normal variation that we see this uh the different thinking style and be just this uh, amazing uh, gift to so many thank you can you say that one phrase again about neurodiversity compared to to biodiversity because I want to make sure it really lands for our audience for sure. I'm going to put it on social media and Katya I'm pretty sure I stole it from you but it was um okay. this uh idea that um, neurodiversity is to human culture as biodiversity is to the ecosystem. I'm going to write that down. Oh, yeah. That we have this range of differences that naturally occurs in our brain. So it's this normal variation in the population. Beautiful. Can you guys tell us where to find you if you have a, if you have a presence online, where to find your book? Sure. We are on Instagram. Um, and uh, we have a very, um, uh, simple and, and, and short, no, I always make a joke cause our, our handle is sort of clunky, but it's neuropsych mom docs. We were trying to cover all the important parts there. Cause I mean, being <laughs> parents is such an enormous part of our identity and what helps us professionally as well. So we're at neuropsych mom doc, doc mom docs on Instagram, and our book is available via Amazon or via our publisher, Boys Town Press. Or uh, I think where any Barnes and Noble, wherever yeah. you can find books. Well, let's hope. Wouldn't it be exciting when we go into a bookstore and actually see it there? I I can't wait. And I mean, it's I'm happening. Happy yes, it, it, that's what's going to happen. But um, our Instagram handle, if uh, people are looking for evidence-based information, we go through different diagnoses, talk about interventions, um, school accommodations, different things like that, to try to make this accessible to the public because not everyone can come and get a neuropsych. So we're hoping that this um, could be helpful for them as well. And I'm sure Paige will put all of the links in the show notes because she's so good about doing that <laughs> so that you can just go to the show notes if you're listening and click and it will take you right to purchase the book or right to their social media platform. Thank you. Exactly. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you for providing this affordable resource um, for parents and children. I think it's going to be really impactful and I'm definitely going to use it in my practice. Oh, thank, thank you so much. much. We just love hearing that. Thank you so much. Um, that's why it's, that's why we did it. Thanks for coming to Mindful as a Mother podcast. If you'd like more of us and Mindful as a Mother, you can find Paige at Instagram at Parenting with Paige and Lindsay at Linz underscore Adams LCSW. Find us on TikTok, Instagram, and in our Facebook group, Creating Community and Smashing Parental Stigma, Embracing Mindful Motherhood and Positive Parenting. Thanks so much and see you next time.